Hey, I'm Amanda Brinkman, and I'm the Chief Brand Officer at Deluxe and the host of the show you're about to watch. So Deluxe started doing this series because we love small businesses. It's not just that they create jobs, we believe they have the power to bring people together. And we wanted to use what we do at Deluxe to help them succeed. Our hope has always been that entrepreneurs can watch a show and learn something that helps them. But the episodes are only a half an hour long, and we can't always show you every step of the process. So if you want to learn a little more, come check us out at deluxe.com slash revolution. Your town doesn't have to win the half a million dollar makeover for the deluxe team to work with your business. What we do on the show is what we do all the time for five and a half million small businesses across the country. We just don't always bring cameras. So remember to shop local and enjoy the show. Roland, can we get the door back there? All right, let's get class six. Okay. Uh, is that feed live? Feed live. Okay. Stay quiet. Yep. Good job, Amanda. Each of the time seconds. Uh, camera rolling. With millions of votes cast, right now in the six finalist towns across the country, thousands of people are gathered to find out if they will be this year's winner of the small business privilege. Four, three, two. One, go. Okay, so we are about 30 seconds out. This is a big deal. The p place is packed. There's a half a million dollar investment from Deluxe on the line. And this entire project is all about the small businesses. And the stakes keep getting higher. Okay, that's my cue. Months of online shows, an epic road trip, and a hard fought open door. I am so excited to share that the winner of the Small Business Revolution Main Street Season 4 is Cersei. Small towns across the country are fighting for their survival with the odds stacked against them. But what happens if we join that fight? If we dedicate a little money, a lot of experience, and thousands of hours of work into one small town, focusing on the businesses at the heart of their Main Street. What started as an idea became a national movement with over 30,000 towns nominated for the $500,000 makeover and more than a million votes cast for the winner. Hello, Cersei! In its fourth season, the small business revolution is headed south to Searcy, Arkansas, and a new town in a new region will present a fresh set of challenges to tackle, both for the small businesses and for the community as a whole. So Amanda Brinkman and her team of marketing experts at Deluxe are going to work, and they're not alone. Renovation expert and co-host Ty Pennington will be working with the team to rehabilitate the town's buildings, while a whole cast of experts help rehabilitate its businesses. Every episode, we'll be working with a new small business to see if we can change the odds, if together we can start a revolution. How long have you had that hat? Well, hats with me are like relationships. You know, they're not long lasting, but they're amazing when I have them. <laughs> I feel like you're kind of all hat, no cattle. <laughs> Uh, Look at this amazing, beautiful countryside. I, I think this is what people think of when they th think of Arkansas. And we're going to show you an amazing small town. So who are we meeting right now? We're meeting Matt and Amy, town leaders. Yes! All right. We're here! Woohoo! Welcome to Cersei! Oh, welcome. Welcome to Cersei Town. Matt! How are you? Hi. Oh. Good to see you. We're so happy to have you. Good man. You ready for this? I am ready. Good deal. I'm well, this is, this is downtown Searcy. That looks like it's got some history. That courthouse was built in 1871, and it's the oldest operating courthouse. Yeah. Yes. In, really? in Arkansas. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I love all the art downtown. The murals by Jason yeah. are gorgeous. Art Alley was such a oh, great yeah, idea. Yeah, so that's a fairly new thing. Yeah, we started the Think Art project, and it's all about kind of this concept of placemaking. You create spaces for the community to come together yeah. around arts and culture, and it's worked. It's been amazing for our town. I mean, I think everybody likes Mayberry, right? I can't go anywhere in this town that I don't know no. people. You can't walk down the street without shaking hands or hugging somebody. and and they look out for each other, and that's pretty special. 
We're 30 to 45 minutes from just about anything you want to do in the state of Arkansas, but still come back to your quiet little close-knit community. It's uh, the city where thousands live as millions wish they could. You know, we've seen a, a big revitalization here downtown, you know. Just in the last five years or so, a lot of new businesses coming downtown. Since 2014, 2015, there's really been a big push. And it's just so sweet to see mom and pop stores and, and young people coming down here and putting in businesses and seeing it come back to life. Just ever since Deluxe has come into town, it's been so much easier to connect with nearby business owners. It's just been an uh, incredible strengthener. It's deepened our relationship. Deepened our relationship. You can feel like this energy buzzing throughout. This is shift and this change. It's feeling a little bit more lively, not so static. The hard work is worth it. So I think sometimes when you do come to some of these main streets that have cute businesses, people always look at it and say, like, well, this main street's fine. Everyone's doing great. I mean, is that the reality? It's really not. You know, everyone struggles in retail. It is great to have events downtown. And when, when we do a Beats and Eats or a Get Down Downtown Festival, we'll have thousands and thousands of people come. The key is to get them into the doors and to get them to come back that next day and shop and eat and really make Cersei a part of their lives trying to make a conscious decision to, to eat locally more and to shop locally more, even if it's a couple of purchases a week, can make a huge difference to people and families who are within your community. And you have to have the people that want to really invest in downtown, because that's yeah, what that's it is. Key. It's like, they, you have to commit, be like, I'm going to put my business, I'm going to put my trust that this is going to grow. It's really a leap of faith in Cersei to open your own business. I think that people love the idea of shopping locally, but they don't really realize the true impact that it has. Were it not for the small businesses, we wouldn't exist the way we do. Cersei used to be agricultural. And then in the 40s and the 50s, that's when they really realized industry was the new thing. And they went out and they recruited really heavily. And so that's where Cersei's economy was. It was, it was industry. When a lot of those jobs went away, um, the oil and gas industry came in sort of at a time and was sort of looked at as like a savior of Cersei. It was just a great time, if you will. Employees made a great deal of money from probably 06 to about 2011 was the main area of time it was. Which was good for booming. us because the recession hit really it, in It buffeted our community, that's exactly right. Yeah. Those jobs came for a little while and when gas prices and oil prices uh, went down, Cersei struggled for a while. These businesses used to be natural gas related businesses. This particular plant had about 300 employees at one time. The one across the street was about 350. And the one around the corner from that was about 700 at one time. I mean, we talk about one person in each business, 700. There's a family behind that. And now we're kind of moving to small business and tourism, and we're really trying to broaden out where we can grow Cersei from. One of the great things about a strong small business sector is that local businesses tend to give back to the community in significant ways. And nowhere is that more true than in Cersei. We have a very giving community, and you can even see that in our businesses, whether it's a nonprofit, a restaurant, a church, a school. We really have that sense of giving back to the people who need the help. We have 443 registered nonprofits right here in Searcy, and that's with a population of 24,000. So it just shows there's a lot of people out there helping each other. One of the most supported aspects of the nonprofit community here is sadly amongst the least supported nationwide foster care. Cersei's commitment to stepping in and taking care of kids when their families can't is unlike anything I've ever seen. Cersei is just an, has an amazing heart, I think. Unfortunately, the need is great, you know, with foster care. I, I think it's exciting to see families stepping up to meet the need, and um, that stems from our belief system. We are a very strong Christian community. We are in the Bible Belt, you know, and so there's a church on every corner. We definitely deal with some of the stereotypes. We're small town, we're in the south, we're rural, we're a dry county. Once upon a time, it was the stereotype. It was very stereotypical, conservative, white. I think it's transitioning to inclusive. If the city doesn't want to die, it has to change.
like any other community in the South. We struggle with what the unknown is. We're very comfortable in that comfort zone that we have around us. Cersei wants to grow. You have one camp that wants to be progressive. You have another camp that wants it to grow, but they want to do it kind of how they've always done it. And so I think that internal struggle is, is really been evident, and I think it's growing. We're not in Austin. Like, we're not going to be hanging rainbow flags from our windows anytime soon. Or, like, Cersei's not ready for that, yeah. at least at this point. But it's not stagnant either. It's, yeah. it's moving, it's growing. Definitely... Change is hard for a lot of people to accept, but to me, change is inevitable. I'm hopeful that uh, we can, as a city, come together and say, you know, we welcome every walk of life, every color of skin. And if you want to improve this community, come on, come be a part of it. I think Cersei is evolving, and it's not a straight line. It's more like a squiggly mess. It's not just this progression. And so we're somewhere in this squiggly mess, Cersei is. And we're not, you know, we're not um, Portland, Oregon, but. I wouldn't still be here after 10 years if I didn't have hope. A squiggly line. That sounds like a pretty good description of human progress in general. And it's not like Cersei is the only town in the country where it's not always easy to be yourself. But we're here to help Cersei thrive. And inclusion and diversity aren't just fundamental American values. There's a huge amount of data that connects those qualities to a town's economic success. This kind of change has to come from within, though. And as applications started rolling in for the six entrepreneurs Deluxe would work with on the show, we got to see the true breadth of what Cersei has to offer. We received over 200 applications in all, and the team at Deluxe painstakingly narrowed that down to 12 finalists, who will pitch our panel on why they should be one of the six businesses featured on the show. We need to represent the right Main Street mix. Food, shopping, services. A downtown needs all of them to thrive. As it shook out, we ended up with three amazing restaurant finalists. Say Rinset, established 2018. I've always wanted to be a small business owner, and I love making crepes, I love cooking for people, I love like hosting people and making them feel taken care of. Wilma's Filipino restaurant, established 2009. Back at home, we would always eat with a lot of people. We always eat like family. We built a restaurant where it's a spot for the whole community. It's like you're in the Philippines. <laughs> Jesse Hohenstein, The Cookie Basket. I've owned it since 2015. It's so much more than just dessert. The salads, sandwiches, the burgers, and the plate lunches. I wanted a place for everybody. It's just a way to connect with people. Retail is key for foot traffic and a shop local culture. But between big box stores and online competition, it's becoming incredibly difficult for small shops to make it work. So we put four retail businesses in our final 12. Taylor Wolf, Blackbird Clothing, established 2007. I want to get people in the store because I love to help them and kind of get them out of their box, maybe their comfort zone, and try something new. Like, I love that. Jose. Katrina. El Mercado Cabanas. Established 2017. Pues la espera de nosotros es que todos se sienten en casa cuando vienen y que si encuentran algo que extrañan de su tierra. Ryan Gibbons, Monk's Habit, Antiques and Games, established 2016. The second generation antique guy. We do a lot of vintage clothes, a lot of vintage records. I love the stories behind the items that I have. I'm Glenn. Loretta. Pollard Studio. Established 2007. People are bringing me pieces of their life, and I'm putting them in a frame for their wall. Sometimes it's priceless. Sometimes it's only priceless to them, but you know it is. So, you know, you have to treat it like it's your own. The downtown is actually a little heavy on professional services, accountants, lawyers, etc. So we focused on two unique service businesses that could really help make Cersei a destination. I'm Nicole. I'm Casey. And we're Numa. Established 2017. It's all about the things they discover in that room, but then they can take it outside, and it affects every aspect of their life. Susan Nolte, Glass from the Past, established in 1997. I have a stained glass shop here in Cersei. It's becoming really popular in homes again, and I would love to teach younger generations because it is a dying art. Every year, we're looking for what makes this particular town unique. In Cersei, the thing that stands out most is our universal commitment to giving back. So it's only appropriate that two of our 12 finalists are nonprofits. Joe Ellis, Make Do, established 2017. 
We offer classes to the public, and then we also are looking for ways to specifically engage vulnerable people in our community through creative activity. Sean Hutkins, Zion Climbing Center, established 2005. The mission of Zion is to create a safe space where anybody can be accepted, be healthy, and be in true community. And finally, in our fourth season doing the show, we're getting to break new ground by having our first true startup make it into the final round. Cody Skinner, Organic Woodwork, established 2019. I was creating tables for foster families and donating them and articles were being written, calls were coming in, and I was just like, what if we did this full time? My wife was like, go for it. Hello. Sam, how are you? Hi. Hi, I'm Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Hi. Amanda. Hi, how are you? Great to see you again. Hi, thanks. Well, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. Oh, thank well, you. It is my pleasure. You're right, very grateful for us. How is business? It is awful. <laughs> I really appreciate you. you want the, it you want is the truth. terrible. Want the truth. It could not be worse. It's really inconsistent, is right. like the best way to say it. I think the idea in the first place was to do coffee shop and then like a few other things. And then now we're like sandwiches and salads and soups and desserts and then all of the crepes that we have and it's just become like actually a lot. Not many people know about Filipino food here. Mm -hmm. Some people, even locals, they think it's Mexican food, but then they get shocked. It's like, it's not Mexican food at all. <laughs> I'll get like a $4,000 line of credit and then I'll pay it off, and then next thing you know, a month or two later, I need to get another small line of credit. Right. So it's like, I'm just, I'm treading water. First three months, we had to pay the rent out of the bucket, I think, two, yes. first two or three months. We were definitely... What's we were... this bucket? I want a bucket like that. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, here's his pocket out of the pocket. <laughs> oh, I got you. We have a few stragglers in the evening, and that's it, you know? So, I mean, whatever we do for lunch, that's, that's our income. We came into it thinking it would be really neat to franchise because we love it and we believe in what we're doing, so we would love to grow. But we have three studios. Two studios are paying for the other. The orders are kind of dwindling in a little at a time, and then I'm having to try not to price myself out of getting that job. But at the same time, it's like, well, any job is better than no job, at the, you know? And so I'm trying to write my story down to tell you and all I'm coming up with is, you know, frustrated artists try not to starve to death. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's how most artists' stories get. No, okay. Exactly. So. From one town to the next, small business owners face so many of the same hardships. But part of choosing the final six will be matching our skill set to the specific obstacles keeping each of these businesses from truly thriving. It's the reason that you're kind of treading water just because you're the only one that can do all the things. There's not enough hours in the day or night, you know. Are you turning and, projects down? Oh yeah. We have 45 employees, but um, I think we bit off more than what we could chew, actually. Was I arrogant thinking we could do this? You know, I can't think about franchising if I've endangered our money or the 45 people. Sorry. No. no. Apologize. We depend more on students. What percent of your customers are from the school? Like 80%. So that's, that's significant. They're not in school, you know, the full year. I have multiple professions. I'm a pastor, college theater professor as well, and have not had as much time or money to devote to the business. Monday, we had a, a decent day. I mean, we did five, 600 bucks, but then yesterday, Y'all, we did $50. I mean, I might as well have gone home. We don't really know a lot about the financial side of it. My dad has handled most of that. Is your father part owner in the business? Yes. I feel like I don't have the authority to do everything. Regardless of the industry, there is one challenge that we hear over and over, more than anything else combined. How do I get people in the door? How are you marketing the business at the moment? We're not. We don't have a website. That's not my strong suit. Yeah, I mean, you've been in your business, you're in the building for 10 years, you said, and you mm -hmm. really don't have any signage out front. Right. I mean, the first time we walked by, I had no idea it was no there. Was. I mean, that, that's right. kind of a red flag a little bit. Yeah. It is. Yeah, for sure. I had a marketing class in college, and I think I slept through. <laughs> <laughs> what? Marketing is fascinating. How did you sleep through it? That must have been the professor. If you were to give the fiscal health of your business, the financial health of your business, a grade, A being, we're rolling in it, F being, uh. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> like, where would you fall? Probably a C. Answer at the same time. Ready, go. C. C. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> I would give us an A. But in order to grow, to move forward with what Joe's vision is, it would not be sufficient, I think. Unfortunately, be an F. It's hard, it's hard to get business when nobody knows you exist. All right. <laughs> Are you making good money? Are you? A D. Yeah. No, I would a agree D. with that. A D. You're not failing. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, not completely passing I mean, grade. We, we, you know, maxed out credit cards, and we've had help from family, and that's how we've stayed in business. We now have 12 businesses sitting in front of us from the town of Searcy that, that have all got great stories and all got great opportunities and great challenges that are in front of them. And the simple question for the both of you is, why should we choose you? Our store is kind of, I feel like it could be a place where cultures could connect and um, interact. We're in the deep south. It's easy to feel outside the bubble here. You might, if you have contrary views, we had a lot of students who are queer or trans that getting a job in Cersei was very difficult. And so I could give them little odd jobs here or there to help them. We have our community, but there are micro communities within our community. When we initially got our location, we wanted to take these communities and bridge them together. That has always kind of been our passion. Why did you decide to start Numa in the first place? I need to take. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. I, said I, would do I needed a place to escape. I went to a yoga class that honestly brought me down to my knees and brought me into tears. And I was like, I didn't realize what I was doing. I've been running away from my problems this whole time. And so it was a huge awakening to me. And in that moment, I was like, I've got to share this. We're a pretty unique couple in Cersei. Probably don't need to say that. And I also want to show, like, you don't have to be what small business owners have historically looked like. You can be young and female and LGBT. Like you can be all those things and people can, will still come to your business. Yeah. Cause that was like a really big fear of ours. Yeah. There's 23,000 kids that age out of the foster care system every year. Out of that 23,000, 20% go immediately homeless. And so as a business now, I can, I can employ those kids and bring something to the community. We come over from the Philippines, my husband and my four kids to have the children a better future. I want this restaurant to mean as much to Cersei as Cersei has meant to me. Now we're down to the unenviable task of choosing the six businesses. By the time you've made it this far, everyone deserves to win. Wilma's Filipino restaurant, the fact that it offers a different kind of cultural experience to Cersei, but also can be a draw for tourism in, I think makes them a really compelling um, business to future. Okay, savor and sip. It feels like they really need kind of that outside help to really get control of the finances. Yeah, I think they need a little bit of definition of what the place is. Cookie Basket Downtown Delight. There are three new restaurants that are popular that I think have impacted Jesse's business. That's a tough problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think organic being a true startup. I mean, we've never worked with a startup and all three seasons. The only thing we need to think about is, can we do this if he stays in his garage? What I'm probably a little more concerned about is where's the market? He can't be charitable if he's not running a successful business. Okay, well let's talk about Monk's Habit, Antiques and Games. I really love Ryan's mission at Monk's Habit, but I mean, he's only open two days a week. This isn't his only source of income. It just feels like there's other businesses here that are reliant on this to support their entire family. The Zion Climbing Center, there's so much that we could do to help them be like a fitness center, a community gathering place. How far can we stretch our dollars from a physical change standpoint? I mean, that's I think like almost... lighting alone would be oh. blow our budget. Yeah. Before we make a decision on Zion, should we talk Let's about Let's talk about those, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like I want to choose Make Do because I love Joe. It sounded like she had a good year, or Make Do had a great yeah. year last year. I feel like they're in better shape than Zion. The other thing too though is Make Do doesn't need a lot of help with their marketing. I think we could help her a little bit behind the scenes. Okay. Blackbird Clothing, I, I love Taylor, I loved her story. Hers I feel is, you know, a business owner who is sort of frustrated and she doesn't know what to do. She knows she should be doing social media. She knows she should be on top of that. We could give her a few tools. 
and help her get back on track without having to you know, be part of the show. Look, what I'd be prepared to do for the businesses that aren't making it through to the series is make myself and my team available. Where we can walk them through the tools and the systems that are available to them through Deluxe and, and monitor their progress through that method. Mm -hmm. Okay. Glass from the past. It's surprising that she's been able to survive without even being online. Mm -hmm. Like, how do people find her, especially since 90% of her business is out of town? Right. She's turning away business. She just needs to take that step and hire someone. And I think she'll just see the whole thing flip on its side. All right, let's put a pin in it, huh? Yeah. Pollard Studio. It's hard to create more demand for a declining business area. I mean, we could tell his story, but if you look at his website, his story is already out there. He's done a nice job of showing the value of having a custom frame on a piece that you love. And so the only thing that would be left for us to kind of help them accomplish is, to your point, creating demand for a declining category. Yeah. Okay. So you have two more we haven't talked about. El Mercado. This would be an amazing opportunity to talk about how do you kind of open up conversations around culture and invite people in. They made it sound like they were doing okay, but I have a large family. They're both in the business. I worry that they don't have as much runway as they think they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I loved the Numa story, and I think that they're struggling with the journey into franchise. If they were to move into a franchise model, they have an opportunity to keep their headquarters here, to provide sources of employment, to truly be a catalyst for Cersei. And I, I would love to see what Deluxe can do to kind of help them think through that next level and, and what building out a franchise could look like. It's impossible to get this choice exactly right. How could any six businesses represent a town of 24,000? But as we got ready for the big announcement, I found myself wrestling with an even bigger question. How do you balance progress with tradition? I think the small businesses we've met here have something to teach us. It's the community rep center. The coffee shop where they already know your order. It's the carpenter. It's mom's cooking. Walking on stage, I'm excited to announce these six businesses to the town. And I'm proud that we're gonna get to work with them. Hello, Cersei! God, this is so awesome. Uh, first of all, you guys really showcase exactly what the show is all about, which is about bringing people together, connecting, having a synergy in your community, and people helping other people to survive and create businesses which can be passed on to family generations. So, the six businesses that are gonna be featured in season four of the Small Business Revolution are I had to pause for the camera. Okay, ready? If you're excited to see the amazing makeovers from Small Business Revolutions Season 4, wait until you see Episode 2, where a rebrand helped make Wilma's Filipino Restaurant a Cersei hotspot. Wilma's Filipino Restaurant is a Cersei gem, serving up home-cooked food you can't find anywhere else in the state. When I think of my mom, she cooks her food out of love. But Wilma is the only chef, and the restaurant is barely breaking even. Income-wise, I don't get much. Can the small business revolution help Wilma provide a better life for her family? Wow. <laughs> this is all my dream. <laughs> On the next episode of Small Business Revolution Main Street,